Well, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Reconciled Church. Uh, we're expecting God to move tonight in great power. Uh, you may expect a time of worship. We're not going to do that tonight. We want to really focus on how we battle to uh, make sure we really are one new humanity in Jesus Christ. Uh, just a few weeks ago, after the murder of George Floyd, I was watching Netflix the 13th and had my little granddaughter. It was the 5 a.m. shift, uh, which seems to be my shift, which is a joy. But at the end of watching this gripping uh, docudrama by Ava DuVernay, I just started weeping. And it's quite hard to weep and not wake your granddaughter up. So I was weeping silently. And when you're weeping, you can't breathe. George Floyd couldn't breathe. People with COVID can't breathe. And we're looking for God to send his spirit so that we can really breathe and be all that we're meant to be and that every member of the church can be all that they want to be. Yeah, we're really excited about this evening. And we're just overwhelmed by the number of people who've wanted to link in with this. This started as something quite small and local, and it's just in a few weeks um, gone global. So we're absolutely delighted about that. Uh, one of the things that we've also been able to do is, I think the slide has already gone up, uh, we've been able to get hold of uh, some copies of Owen's book. Owen Hilton has written a book called Crossing the Divide uh, on this subject. And um, there are two ways that you can, you can get hold of that. Uh, we have decided we want to give away um, 50 free Kindle copies. So you can see the email address there for that. Um, there's also uh, paperbacks that are available that Owen himself has. And again, you can see the email address there. Um, so, yeah, we just want to get the word out there. So let us know uh, if you want to partake in this. Uh, Owen has so kindly said he's happy to uh, support this, but it's going to cost him a load of money in postage. So if you'd like to, if you'd like to, you're very welcome to make a donation uh, just to help cover postage costs to Beacon Church. But you don't have to. That's totally up to you. We're all under grace. So th the second thing is that this evening's being recorded. So I know there are many people who aren't able to connect in with us tonight, but would love to see this, or people in your church may want to see this. Mm -hmm. So. If you want to get hold of the recording, then again, just use those same two email addresses um, that you've just seen up there and you'll be able to access the link. Somebody will send that to you. Uh, so very soon we'll have Angela Kem speaking to us. She's from City Church, Cambridge, and uh, just an amazing story of her life in South Africa during apartheid and then here making a difference in our churches. And right now we've got the wonderful Owen Hilton, who's from Beacon Church in Brixton. We've got two of his students up here in Liverpool, and it's just a joy to have them. He's such a good discipler, and we need all the help we can get growing and continuing to grow as people of God. Let's welcome, you have to do it with a wavy <laughs> type thing or a clap. Let's, let's welcome Owen. <laughs> Thanks, Graham. Um, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a privilege to be with you again. I, I loved my trip to Liverpool um, and uh, various other parts of the north that I visited. And so it, it's, it's a privilege to be with you. Um, it's also it's a challenge in, in, in this season. And um, hopefully some of that will come out. Um, just a, a, a little bit about me. I, I, I grew up in a New Frontiers church in, in Catford, South East London. I was born in Catford. Uh, my parents are from Jamaica and I ended up at King's, what is now King's in London. And I worked on the staff there for a number of years before I uh, took on Beacon Church uh, in Brixton about 10, 11 years ago. Um, so... No, being really honest, my book is that old. My book I wrote just before I left Kings, 
Um, but I've got loads of copies and I'm really happy to give them away. So if you want one, uh, please do get in touch. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of stuff going on in recent weeks sparked by the death of George Floyd. It has exposed deep levels of racial injustice and inequality. And at the same time, it's exposed deep levels of pain and hurt and no doubt for some, a measure of confusion and fear during this time. It will be affecting churches, I imagine, like yours, um, and churches like mine. It definitely hasn't had an impact on my church. Today is an opportunity for us to address these issues together and to bring God into the heart of it. And um, I love Angela Kem. She would be one of my... Uh, Christian heroes and you know when I spoke to her about this she was saying what we really need is God and so that's where we're going we're going to a moment of encounter with him but before we do that the vision I want to set before you uh, as a group of people is that of the reconciled church Uh, to be honest uh, I'm not here to try and persuade you of anything I'm not here uh, along with Angela. I'm here with Angela to help paint a picture of the church as I believe it should be and trust that God will move your heart and open your eyes. I'm asking you to check your heart as I speak. Is it open or is it closed? You'll know by how you react to stuff that you hear, whether you become inside and maybe a bit defensive or you begin to justify things, or whether you're open and you're listening to what is being said. Before I talk about specifically the reconciled church, I want to just give a bit of context for where we are. Um, You've probably heard it, but this is really a historic moment that we're in, uh, both through um, COVID and the lockdown, which were unprecedented in our in, in peacetime in our country, in our nation. And then the death of George Floyd, so graphic and tragic on our phones and Instagrams. And, and, and we've seen that video. Um, it's a unique opportunity for real change with everything that has come after that. Um, There's a danger, though, that we can get caught up in church life post-COVID, that the George Floyd stuff might just drop off a bit and that we lose part of what I believe is our generational responsibility as the church. Many of us are working through and on, even now, online and digital church. And to be honest, I, I love that. I love the fact that I can talk to people in the north from my office at home. I I love that. Um, And all of that is really important, but it's not as important in the heart of God as the reconciled church. And it's not something you're going to give your life for, digital church or online church, but you might give your life for the reconciled church. Secondly, we're in new territory, and this is new territory for all. Uh, None of us have been this way before. Uh, I may see a bit of the way ahead. Uh, Angela certainly sees a bit of the way ahead, but we've never been this way before. Uh, But we are in a movement that is pioneering and full of faith and full of vision. And I'm hoping and I'm praying that that's what will take us on to building the Reconciled Church. The other thing I just want to say is that the world is different from the church and we must remember that. Our primary focus is the local church. It's the church that we attend. It's the church that we engage with. It might be the church that you lead. Um, We can't and we mustn't ignore what's happening beyond the church, some of which is a catalyst for where we are now. But the main issues for us are not George Floyd. It's not Black Lives Matter. It's not the removal of statues. It's the local church. It's the people of God. It's how do we reconcile um, around issues of race and diversity in our local church context? Up to this point, we've kind of understood Ephesians 2 when it talks about one new humanity, um, but it hasn't brought for us the reconciliation that the scripture promises and that is available. And so we need to look again. 
And then the other thing, just by way of context, is simply to say this is a God thing. Uh, some of us will need our minds renewed. We need revelation, fresh revelation from God. Others of us need our hearts opened. We, we need to become humble. We need humility. For others, we need to know the peace of God that guards our hearts and our minds. And maybe also we need to have our hearts healed from the hurts of the past. Without this, we'll never make the changes that we need to make. Um, we'll never see a reconciled church. And tonight is an opportunity to begin that process of fresh revelation, healing, repentance and forgiveness. I don't know how all of that works on Zoom, but I'm, I'm trusting that that's where we're going to go and that we can walk truly free today. Over recent weeks, it, you know, as Graham talked about uh, watching that documentary, I've met many, many people over recent weeks who have been broken by this issue, who never expected. They thought they'd got it sorted. Um, there's one guy who lives in Sutton and he was telling me, oh, I've cried every day. I've cried every day since this. God has really broken my heart to it. So when I talk about the reconciled church, what do I mean? What am I talking about? I'm, I'm just going to read a very familiar passage from, it, from Ephesians chapter two. And it says these words. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So when I talk about the reconciled church, I'm literally talking about the fact that Jesus took uh, people who were estranged from one another. In, in this particular case, he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. And in his own body, he reconciles them both to God through the cross, ending their hostility and bringing peace. And that is what we're looking for. We're looking for the end of hostility. We're looking for peaceful relationships. What does it look like the other side of the cross? Well, as I just said, it looks like peace. That might be a surprising thing when you think about um, racial tensions and you think about the way the world is now. We might wonder, how will there ever be peace? But actually, the cross brings peace for us. Uh, secondly, uh, the Bible talks about table fellowship. It talks about cultural barriers being removed and relationships beginning. Uh, one of the things that the cross ended was Jews not associating with Gentiles, not able to eat with them. Suddenly they were eating at the table together. And that was one of the signs of the end of hostility. It talks about body ministry. In, in 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about we are the body of Christ. It talks about when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. It talks about having equal concern for one another. Equal concern is not 50-50, oh, I give 50% of my time here and 50% of my time there. It's giving the level of concern that is required by any given person or any given group of people. You know, if you have a newborn baby, you give more time there. If you have a sick patient, you give more time there. If you have a traumatized individual, you give more time there. Um, that's what equal concern means. It also means putting right the wrongs of inequality and injustice. And it's interesting, there's, a, there's just a famous story in the Bible about that, the story of Zacchaeus. When Zacchaeus meets Jesus, and when he begins to understand who Jesus is and he responds to him, what's the first thing he does is he he gives recompense. He pays back. He does the right thing. He doesn't just make some kind of verbal um, connection to Jesus, but he actually does something about it. And so I think there is something about putting right wrongs. And then there's making a way for others. And uh, the story of Barnabas who is the he's the person who really discovers the Apostle Paul. And when Paul comes to Jerusalem and he's getting a bit 
Uh, they're, they're at him a little bit. It's Barnabas who steps in, pulls him out and brings him to the apostles. When Paul is sent off to Tarsus, it's Barnabas who goes and gets him back, brings him to Antioch, uh, works with him, invests in him. And you see Paul goes flying off into ministry. So sometimes we need to make a way for other people. So the reconciled church, what does it look like? I'm just going to give three things that it's not, and then I'm going to give a number of things that it is. And I'm just going to go through this, and and hopefully it's recorded if you want to listen back. Uh, The first thing about what it's not, the reconciled church is not simply a church that has diversity in it. In many ways, we have achieved diversity in our churches by doing little more than planting them being who we are, worshipping the way that we do, and people from different backgrounds have come along, which is wonderful. But that is not a sign of reconciliation. Many groups are diverse. Many professional sports teams are diverse. Diversity is not the aim. Diversity might be the beginning of the way in which the world is now, but it's not what reconciliation is. There is more to it than that. Reconciliation is not even when you have leaders of diversity in your community. It's great if you get that, but that in itself is not a sign that you have reconciled. And it's not even a sign if you, um, reconciliation is not even a sign if you have understood the theology of one new humanity. And many of us could could quote Ephesians 2 and, and talk about that theology, but simply understanding that theology is not a sign of reconciliation. Sadly, in my view, that theology, that tag of one new humanity has become a bit of a tagline for our churches rather than a reality of our experience. And it's the reality that we're looking for. And we would all agree with that, I think, because over the last few weeks, I don't know about in your church, in my church, there have been many explosions Many pastoral explosions as people, deep, deep, deep wounds have come to the surface. People who may have gone through all our pastoral ministries suddenly are exploding with pain and with hurt and with anger. And we're wondering what is going on. So we, there are clearly things that we haven't been able to deal with up to now. So what is it then? What are we looking for when we talk about the reconciled church? I'm just going to make a number of statements. And I'm sure you can pack it over over the days, but a number of statements I want to make. A reconciled church is a local community of believers. It's when a local community of believers in India reach across the caste system to build a church and bring peace with their neighbours. It's when a local community of believers in Nigeria bridges the tribal divide and bring peace between them and their neighbours. It's when a local community of believers in a church in the UK or in the US reach out across the racial divide and bring peace in relationships with their neighbours who are different to them because of what Jesus has achieved on the cross. It's local. It's not simply um, the worldwide church is one new humanity. This has a local expression in local churches. Secondly, a reconciled church is one where we have faced our history and our present reality of oppression and injustice. No matter how ugly it looks, we've faced it. And we've brought those things to the cross where Jesus deals with them and we can find peace and forgiveness. But we have to face them. We have to face that reality. We have to face that history. A reconciled church has a foundation of repentance and forgiveness and healing. And it builds on that through grace. And when we talk about grace here, it's not simply that, oh, you know, I've, I've, I've been forgiven and, and it's as though I've not sinned or anything like that. It is also about a fundamental acceptance of people. Fundamentally, I accept you. I don't judge you. I don't not accept you because you look different to me. Uh, I accept you. And also, a fa- you build on kindness 
because kindness is a fruit of the spirit and it goes way beyond any kind of cultural niceties. Kindness is something that the Holy Spirit does in us. Kindness is what the Good Samaritan did on the road. And so a reconciled church has that. A reconciled church has removed cultural barriers, no matter how precious they are to us. Sometimes culture is what keeps us apart. The way we worship, the way we pray, the way we dress, the way we build relationships, the way we identify leaders, the way we parent our children, much of that is cultural. Much of that is not just in the Bible. It's just the way our culture works. And actually, sometimes they can be barriers to us reaching other people and they can be barriers to other people coming into us. And sometimes we don't even allow them in until they do the things the way that we want them to be done. We assimilate people. We don't necessarily include them. Like the New Testament church which had to fundamentally change in some of its actions and attitudes and and practices in order that the reconciled church could emerge. Jews, Gentiles eating together was a fundamental change in the way that the Jews operated. Until that time, they thought that eating separately was part of the deal. It was part of the way God intended it. And then things changed. All those differences, all those barriers were removed at the cross. The reconciled church is full of Christians who first and foremost identify themselves as Christian and are willing to relegate other identities as secondary to that. At times, this might mean you give up rights and privileges that come from your race. You're a new creation in Christ. You no longer regard people from a worldly point of view. It's an issue of identity. I had to go through that. I remember as an 18 year old, um, as a teenager, um, I was living in a world that I went to a church which was predominantly white people um, and I wasn't white. And that was really obvious. But I wasn't going to a black church. So I wasn't living in that kind of heritage. I remember saying to myself, I know what I'll be. I'll be Christian. That's what I'll be. And I realized that actually for all of us, being Christian should be our first identity. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes we label ourselves more than just being Christian. But I think in the reconciled church, um, you want to identify as Christian, not just first and foremost, but really ultimately Christian is what you are. The reconciled church is a place where I might have a depth of family relationship unheard of among people of such differences. In theory, at least, I should have more in common with the Christian brothers and sisters who have arrived here from the other side of the world than I do with my neighbours next door who do not believe but who look like me. In theory, at least, I should have more in common with the believer. That only happens when I recognize that culture needs to be put down a bit and that faith and identity in Christ needs to rise a bit. A reconciled church recognizes that people are different, black, white, old, young, male and female, and that these differences have an impact on life for people. Nevertheless, it does not judge them by those differences or qualify or categorize them in the way that the world might, but rather we show empathy and compassion at injustice and mistreatment. We advocate for people, we help them. We we don't perpetuate the problems that they are going through. Historically, in the UK, the way we have understood diversity is to be kind of colorblind and almost not notice differences. But when you don't notice differences, you're also not noticing uh, the the problems that some people have simply because they look different to you in the world that they live in. And so it's important that we notice differences. We recognize that people are different to us, even though we're not going to judge them by that. The reconciled church is a church where you know your differences are understood, but they are not barriers to your inclusion and your involvement. 
You may have people in your church who have a different accent to you, who look different to you, who dress different to you. And and they need those differences to be understood, but they can't be judged by those differences. You may experience racism in the world, but in a reconciled church, you won't experience racism. But the reality for many of us, for me, I grew up in a church um, which loved Jesus. And I found Jesus in that church. But alongside Jesus, I also found prejudice. I also found discrimination. And I had to push through barriers in order to embrace Jesus, because there were moments where I could see, particularly looking back, I was treated differently because of the color of my skin. And the reconciled church, that's not going to happen. It's not that the church is perfect, but it understands these things enough that those things are not going to happen in that church. A reconciled church has removed the lenses of unconscious bias positively towards people who look like me or negatively towards people who don't. You've got to remove them. And in a reconciled church, a church that is really pushing into this, those unconscious biases won't be there. We'll take off those lenses and we will see people as God sees them. And we and we embrace them in that way. A reconciled church has to move beyond the celebration of our differences. Hear me on this one, because I know we love to celebrate differences to celebrate in the fact that Jesus has brought us together at the cross. It's focusing on what unites us rather than all the different things that might divide us or are highlighted. If I'm the only black person in your church and and you go for some kind of uh, celebration of culture, I'm going to feel a little bit embarrassed there. I'm going to feel a little bit, oh, I'm the only person and I've got to now be Jamaican because that's my background. It's not the differences that count. The big the big message or the wonderful thing of the cross is not that we have all these differences. It's what he has done to bring us together. And that's what I think the reconciled church celebrates. You see, culture is very important. I understand that. But it's not sacred. It's not sacred. And where the cross and the culture meet, culture should die. Culture must die. And that's what happens in a reconciled church, or that's what we're believing for in the reconciled church. A reconciled church is in and of itself a witness to the world. As it achieves a level of racial unity or even tribal unity and harmony unparalleled anywhere else. There are all sorts of issues that we are facing in the world today. But one of the things that has happened is there is a massive opportunity for the church to demonstrate a lead on these things because we can take them further and deeper than anything else. Will we do it? Will we do it? Owning at the cross, owning at the cross of Jesus can this be achieved. It tells the world, the reconciled church, the, this witness tells the world more about Jesus being the son of God than almost anything else we can do. It talks about that in John 17, that they will know that I came from you. That's what Jesus prays because of the unity of the disciples. My sincere hope and prayer is that the church doesn't withdraw from or move on from this moment too soon. I'm not looking, I'm not talking about the world here. I'm not talking about social media where maybe all that kind of stuff has been relegated down your your feed. I'm not talking about society at large. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about local church congregations. My prayer is that we'll be more courageous that we'll be more thorough, we'll be more humble in our response to see the name of Jesus lifted high and honoured. Our aim is to see the church reconciled just as we have seen it restored. I mean, when I was a kid was when the restoration of the church was happening. The new church movement was happening. People were leaving their old churches and they were trying to find a new expression of, of church life. 
for some of you, even on this call, that might just seem really normal. But but growing up, I remember churches were splitting. My very old church, it split. A whole group of them left to come to another church because they wanted to experience New Testament church life. The church has been restored. It, that doesn't mean it's perfect. But it does mean that it functions very differently to what it what the average church functioned like 50, 60 years ago that it has been impacted by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It has been impacted by those kinds of things. Well, we want to see the church reconciled. We want to see churches where these kinds of injustices do not happen. We want to see a church where people come along and they can feel safe and that they don't receive exactly the same um, racism in the church as they did in the world outside. We don't want to see that anymore. But the truth is, we do see that. But we don't want to see that anymore. We want to see the church reconciled, brought together. The reality is that we haven't understood it as much as we think we have done, which is why we don't see it as much as we think we should. One new humanity, the reconciliation in relationships, which are full of peace, it's our purpose, it's our aim, it's our responsibility. There was a whole raft of people 40, 50 years, years ago who gave their lives for the restoration of the church. They saw something in God and they gave themselves for it. Will we do the same for the reconciliation of the church? I don't know how many of you have ever been to New Day, New Day the the youth event that we uh, run and uh, I'm involved in, I'm helping to run that. And last year was, was, was amazing. It was, it was one of our biggest years. We had thousands and thousands of people, um, but it was probably also our most diverse year. There must've been close to a thousand, if not more um, black kids from London and other urban centers around the country. Our youth event is probably the most diverse youth event in this country. There are other youth events. People came to New Day and they were like, wow, how did you manage to do that? We had people speaking at New Day who years before were sitting on the carpet um, just as, as delegates and now they're, now they're preaching. It was amazing. And it feels to me like New Day is the inheritance of our movement. New Day is the legacy of our movement. It stands alone in its diversity. But to that generation, it is incumbent upon us to hand over a church more reconciled than the one that we were given. That's what we're here to do. We're not simply here to make social media work in the church. We're not here simply to have bigger numbers. We are here to do something that is in the very heart of God, which is why Ephesians 2, right at the core of the gospel, is this idea of reconciliation with people. It's massive. It's massive. It may have only just come out now in terms of it's been exposed and we realise, oh, my goodness, we haven't got this sorted. We haven't dealt with this in the way that we should have done. That might mean for some of us we need to repent. For some of us we need to forgive. Some of us we need to say, God, change my mind. Heal me. Some of us need to do that. But it's massive for us. It's a generational responsibility. It's not my responsibility, as I said at the beginning. I'm not here to persuade you, but I am here to present to you the reconciled church and say, will you get on board with building that thing with all that you've got, all that God has given you? That's my prayer for us. And, and as, as I hand over to Angela now, that, that's my prayer, that some of us will catch hold of this and we will give ourselves to it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hi, everyone. Good to see all of you here. So many of you. What a bonus. And as you can hear, I speak with an accent because I come from Cape Town and I grew up in the time of apartheid um, where, as you know, white and black were not allowed to meet together. And it was a law that we weren't allowed to meet together. But God had other plans because God is into reconciliation. 
And so he sent me into the townships of Cape Town to make friends, to preach the gospel, make friends. And I thought I was going in to do some good deeds. But actually God sent me in to change my own mind. I think I needed so much help as a white person growing up in a racist nation. And God really um, worked hard with me to change my mindset. Um, it was a difficult time. I can't say that I said, please, Lord, use me, use me. I said, please, Lord, don't use me because it is so difficult. I found it so difficult. You see, I thought that everybody thought like me. I thought that my way of thinking is the way, is the only way, until I found a people who, besides agreeing on Jesus, didn't agree with me on much else of, of my of way of thinking, because my way of thinking came from a more what is now called white privilege or a superior attitude of being able to do things and know things, just know everything. We're the leaders. We're the ones who do stuff. And I realized that that is not true at all. And I found that I had to die to my own way of thinking. I had to uh, watch how I spoke because... A lot of what I was saying had a superior ring to it, and we don't even realize it. That's the whole thing. It was unconscious bias. It was so unconscious that it I wouldn't have called myself a racist. Though I grew up in a racist nation, I can't tell you that I purposely was a racist. And yet I was a racist because of my unconscious bias. And so I call myself um, a recovering racist, really, which is a shock to people because we, we don't mind saying I'm a recovering alcoholic or I'm a recovering drug addict, but a recovering racist, wow. And I love to say that, to actually bring a shock to, to us and to white people because we are unconscious of the way we think. It's just there. It is just the, I didn't even have to work hard. It, it's just there. Um, and it's hard to explain. And that's why we need God so much. So I had to sit with, with my black friends and ask them to help me, to help me get to unlearn all the stuff that had been just put into me from birth, by the way I grew up, from history, from schooling, from just the way the world is, really. And um, uh, so I had to ask my friends, please help me. Please help me to get the, the strongholds in my thinking broken. And it was quite a process. It took ages. And I had to watch all the time how, what I'm saying, how I think. It is such hard work. I was always tired. Ah, I just want to speak to my own people because that then I can just be me. Now I'm kind of crossing the divide, uh, the book that Owen wrote, and it's, it's work. But you know what? It is so rewarding, so satisfying, and it's the only way to be a reconciled church. Jesus, uh, being in very nature God, did not count equality with God, something to be crossed, but humbled himself. And that's what God calls us to do. And I'm on a journey still. Being in a mostly white environment all the time, even in this nation, um, I have to watch my thinking. I have to keep a check on myself that I don't slip into the old patterns of thinking because they just hang there. So I have to work at this all the time. Um, but I'm grateful that God got hold of me, and it's a real privilege to be able to speak to all of you in this way and to just call on God to help us, to help us to 
You know, we are the church. I love the church, capital C. The church to me has an answer for everything. We are the head and not the tail. So even in South Africa, in Cape Town, um, for me, I thought of myself as, well, I'm God's child and I represent the church and therefore was able to uh, not only help the poor, uh, but also fight against apartheid, go to parliament, um, untrained in all these things, but God. Because I knew God had chosen me to do this and because I'm church and therefore have this power to actually break strongholds in thinking to show the world um, the model of who we are supposed to be. The church is the model to the world. And so my eyes are on the UK church, really, on new frontiers in England and wider, but here to say, come on, church, let's be a model of how things should be working in this nation, because we may be waiting for government or we may be waiting for somebody, the world, to put something in place. But, you know, they're not going to get it right without the church coming alongside. And so we should be able to say, come with us, we'll do you good. Come, see what we're doing. Come and learn from us. And therefore, it's a time to, to actually um, stop before God and say, Lord, do something in us. I have had to say to God when I was in Cape Town, put my hands on my head and say, Father God, take away my thinking. Lord Jesus, do something in my head because I don't get it. I don't get it. And then one day I got it and I started seeing, maybe as other people see, and, um, and, and it, it's a continual asking God, help me all the time. My eyes are on God in this whole thing. But it's so rewarding and so very satisfying. And it just brings the signs and the wonders. We're longing for signs and wonders and miracles and revival. This is it. As we do this, my word, the, the signs and wonders will follow as we walk together, all different cultures, walking together, arm in arm, in arm as the army of God, moving things on. Uh, coming against the strongholds of the uh, that are in the world, the demonic strongholds, and advancing the kingdom with a capital K. And so, speaking from a white person's perspective, uh, this is a time where we need to stop. We need to listen, please. I'm talking to. Uh, I'm just talking to you. Please listen, white people. We don't often address ourselves as white people because often we're not even aware of, we are white. And that is what white privilege is, is because we're not aware that we are white. We just, we just hear. And we are unaware even of our color until we have to mark it on a piece of paper to say what, you know, are you white or you're black or whatever. And we put a cross and then we know we're white. Um, and so I'm going to be saying white people quite a lot as I speak because I'm addressing white people as well as people of colour. And um, so we need to stop. We need to listen. We need to ask questions. But don't ask the questions so that people of colour are doing all the work for you. It is we need to read. I read every day. I read blogs. I read books. I want to know what every side of the argument is saying. I, I, I educate myself all the time. And even being in the UK, I've been educating myself from the time I've come. I've come here for such a time as this, I believe. I didn't know that such a time was coming. But I just pump with this reconciliation with the church we, the church, with all different cultures and races and nations. How exciting is that? And so we educate ourselves. We choose to walk humbly, even if everything inside us is screaming, yes, but, yes, but. 
there's a scream sometimes. I've spoken to various white people after the George, uh, George Floyd died, and people have argued, yes, but, yes, but, and I understand the yes, but. But this is actually a time to stop the yes, but, and to just say, Father God, help me. Keep a, a, a hold on our tongues and just say, Father God, help me. I don't get it. It makes me cross. I don't get this whole white privilege. Mm. I'm not privileged. I grew, people may think or have said to me, I grew up poor as a white person. I grew up uh, with abuse. I grew up with all this. How can I be privileged? But that's not what white privilege is. It's the color of the skin. So I would bring a team of my people from the townships to Stonely Bible Week for all those of you who used to go to those. Amazing. And I had to say to my, my friends, when you get to Heathrow, I will be, I and my Greg and I will get through. You're going to be stopped because you're black and you will be searched, taken aside and searched. And every time it happened, that's what white privilege is. And I came through on a South African passport and my friends did. We, Greg and I got through. We white, privileged. We don't do no wrong, no wrong, no wrong. Um, and my black friends were searched. And, this, and so we, we wept. I used to weep with them from embarrassment, from shame, from oh, the pain of how can this be with the church, with the church. Um, we need to bring about lasting change. We need the fullness of the Holy Spirit to, bring, to help us. I'm going to talk about the Holy Spirit all the time because I love him. I love Jesus. Um, I want to see revival. I want to see people born again. I want to see, whoa, the gospel preached with power. I want white and black and all colors to be on the streets together, preaching, knocking on doors, saying, look at us. We've got something that you need. It's him. And that's my passion to see it. And, and it's not that I'm dreaming these things up. I have a history. And I have a history where I've done this and seen it work in a very racist nation and seen uh, people being saved. We've led hundreds of people to the Lord. And I myself have led hundreds of people to the Lord and move people from shacks, corrugated iron shacks, into brick housing for the first time in our area of the Western Cape. I have seen God do the most amazing miracles. I have seen the blind see and the lame walk and the deaf hear. And when you get involved like this, stuff happens. We long to be in the building on a Sunday, then stuff is going to happen. And I love Sundays. But let me tell you, when we are in the world and we are talking about Jesus and we are together, all different colors, stuff happens. We are the church and we have this inheritance that the world is longing for, but they don't even know because they haven't seen us do these things. And I'm hoping that as lockdown lifts, this will be our inheritance from a horrible lockdown that we become this powerful, potent church being out there in the world and saying we can help. We can help. We have this inheritance from God to give away of signs and wonders and miracles because it comes from him. We need to come before God and admit that we are unable to do anything. And that's the whole thing. Often, you know, when I first went into the townships, uh, once the black people became friends with me and sussed out that I was all right, um, then I started hearing uh, what people thought, and they said, uh, you white people, we call you the fix-its because you want to fix everything. You, you don't talk through much. You just have a plan. We, we just make a plan, and we fix it. And you see, with this that is going on, if we were able to fix it, we wouldn't be online on Zoom now 
And we all Zoomed out. So we wouldn't give up whole evening to be on Zoom if we had fixed it. <clears throat> but this is something, as Owen said, <clears throat> we haven't been this way before. We can't fix it. We need to come to God and say, Father God, Father God, help. But we need to be willing to come and ask for help. And that's a huge step. Are we willing to come and ask for help? Or we are we still at the point of, yes, but I've also suffered. Yes, but. Yes, but. Um, we need to put our butts down. Uh, B-U-T-S. No other kind of butts. And we need to put it down. I'm, I've got humor. We've got to laugh as well. Humor. Humor makes the world go around. We must have humor. Excuse me for my humor, but uh, humor breaks that religious spirit, you know. We get all, but I can't help a joke. So you've got to bear with me. <laughs> um, but we, we can't, we aren't able to do anything. My, if I had to give advice on ministry, people say, how do you do what you do? You know, I do what I do. I come to God and say, well, my eyes on you. I can do nothing. But Holy Spirit, you live in me. And I am going to put my eyes on you, Lord, and, and put myself in a place where you can help me. Come and help. Work through me because I can't do it. You must do it. And you know, he comes rushing in. He loves, God is attracted to faith, and he loves coming where faith is. We need God to open our eyes to the pain that people of color are experiencing. And we need to know, you know, the Bible says when one part of the body hurts, we all hurt. And, and our people of color, our uh, black people and um, uh, black and uh, minority ethnic are hurting. There's a hurting going on. And we, as the white part of the church, have got to say, people are hurting. We've got to stop. There's a whole contingent of our body that's hurting. We need to stop and see what's going on, not just keep on running, let's run, let's run. We must stop and say, Let's get together. Let's talk. How do we help? How do we get things done? Help us. Let's talk. And uh, as it's in the Bible, God says to us, come, let's reason together. We need to reason together as church of all different colors and bring help to each other. We need to help the hurting. And, the, you know, the whole body is hurting. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so many people online tonight. We are all hurting. Something's not, something's out of kilter. And we've got to get something right so that the power, so we have the power to stand combined and move forward um, to advance the kingdom. We need empathy and humility kindness, fruits of the spirit, and we need oodles of compassion. But please, no, com no patronizing. It's so easy to patronize. We get, let's go, can I help you? And again, that is a superior. I went into the townships at first, so patronizing, because I went as somebody going to help. Here I am, I'm going to help. And it's like people didn't need that kind of help. They needed me as a friend. And I found the very people who I went, came to help helped me and shaped me into who I am today. And I'm eternally grateful for my friends in Cape Town who suffered so much to help me make me who I am today. We need breakthrough in our minds. We need renewing in our minds. We need to come to God and say, do something I, do, I just don't understand. I don't understand it all. It, this is all new to me. What happened after George Floyd died? What, what is happening in the church? But you see, this is long before George Floyd. This is a history 
of of uh, being um, history of pain of people of color. History, it's just there. And God, when George Floyd died, as if God blew on it and says, now church, this needs to be sorted. Because there's, you know, we need a healed church to go forward so that we can inherit all the promises of God and all he's got for the world and this revival that we've prayed for so much. And, you know, white, black and white people need healing. Black people need healing. White people need healing from the way we've had to felt we carried the load. We always got to go and help the Africans or we've got to help somebody or now we've got to change again. Why can't somebody say to me, why doesn't black, why can't black people change? Why must white people change? And so both of us need to come to the cross really together and say, Father, You've got to help us. We both need healing. I found that my friends in the township, I needed, um, I needed changing from the superior attitude. But my friends in the township needed healing from always being treated as inferior and, and, and needed to, uh, to just get hold of something in, the, in themselves. Of, no, hold on. We as much the head and not the tail as what white folks are. And it's a real breakthrough. We stood together in this breakthrough. Father God, heal all of us. Bring such a spirit of healing for each one of us because we all need something to go on in our heads of healing. We need revival in our own individual lives and, and in the church corporate. Aren't you longing for revival? You can wave your hands if you're longing for revival. Oh, we're longing for revival. And you know, this to me is the first, it's like the touches of revival. If we can get this, oh my word, how the Holy Spirit will flow through us, how we'll worship together will make the world look as we come to God and lament. Father God, we lim it's, a, it's, a, it's a weeping of lament, Father God. We are all in pain, Lord. Bring healing to us. Bring healing to the church in this nation and then the nations. Make us a model. Like the church in, in Thessalonica, we became a, they said we became a model. You became a model. I want to ask, Father, that this church in the UK becomes a model, a model for something new in this nation, Lord. We need to come to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's what we're going to do tonight. I can't do anything without ministry, without being filled with the Spirit. And um, we need Jesus. We need to come to the cross of Jesus and say, Father, you know, Lord, break any holds of superiority or inferiority over us. Break the holds, Lord. And, you know, it takes huge humility. It takes such courage to actually say, I feel inferior or superior. It's, it's a huge thing. We even need the Holy Spirit to help us to do that because that's a huge deal to actually come like that because we're quite a together people. We come from the West. We ferry together. And it's like, no, let's just come to God. Um, and so, you know, even now, let's come to God. And I want to ask Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come and fill us. Come and fill us, Holy Spirit. Every single one of us is 127 squares on Zoom tonight. And some have got two people on and some have got three and so on. Holy Spirit, will you come and sweep through each one of us? Fill us, bubble up inside us. Lord, heal us from lockdown. Heal us from COVID, Lord, from, from the lockdown feeling, from, the, from feeling left out, from separation, from over-Zooming from not being able to sing as the corporate 
body and worship you. We have suffered through this COVID by being separated. So, Father, come and bring healing to us from those who've had, who have COVID, who've had COVID and are suffering still from the side effects. But, Lord, will you come and do something so special in us tonight from lockdown in the name of Jesus? And then, Lord, just from what everything that Owen and I have said, Father God, Father God, we just come to the cross and we ask, Lord, forgive us. Lord Jesus, will you forgive us for any superior attitudes or inferior or any finger pointing or the anger or the yes buts or the um, the stuff? You know our minds, Lord. You know what God goes on. And we ask, Lord, we the church, Lord, you be your kids. You chose each one of us before time. And you've prepared good works in advance for us to do. And we want tonight something to happen. So we can we move on in our good works to bring reconciliation and revival to this nation and the nations. And so we ask, Lord, if you will, this is all by grace, and I'm not forcing you to do a thing. I'm just here, you know. If you will put your hands on your head, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come. And Father God, I want to ask that you break strongholds in our thinking. I want to ask, Lord, for myself and for each one of us, Lord, we come to you seriously, Lord. And we ask, break any strongholds that have been built up from, from way back, from parents, from school, from how we live, just from the, the culture that we come from. Every one of us, no matter what color, what nation, will you break strongholds in our thinking? Lord Jesus, we've only got you. We've only got you. And Satan, we stand against you in the name of Jesus. And we say, we've seen you. You're the one who divides. You divide all the time. And we say, no more division. No more division in the name of Jesus. We see you. And Jesus has overcome you. He's crushed your head. And so, Father God, we ask for healing now in our minds. Lord, we will educate ourselves. We will learn. We will ask questions. But will you take away those, that layer of stronghold that keeps us from moving on, the yes buts and the, and the excuses? And, and, Father God, I want to ask for healing from pain, pain in black people, pain in all um, different nationalities, Lord, pain for feeling different, being treated different. I want to ask for healing, Father. I want to ask for healing for white people who feel a bit got at at this moment. Father God, I want to ask for healing for, for us, for every single one of us on the, on, this, on the Zoom and our families and wider families. And you know, Lord, we ask for healing. We're very serious tonight, Lord. We're very serious, and we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we just say thank you, Lord, because when we come in your name and it's according to your will, you hear us. So, Lord, I am so grateful. I am so grateful for a people who have been willing and open. And, Lord, we look forward to see what happens over this next while. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. But now we're also going to pray for the sick because you see, we're the church and the gospel is full and rounded. And the gospel comes with healing for the sick, healing of minds, healing of racism, healing of, it's all in the same gospel package. If we treat the black issue as, a, as an issue, we, we, we bring dishonor to our, to our people of color. It's not an issue. It's just part of the gospel. It's reconciliation. That's just what we do. But we also bring healing to the sick. We bring words of knowledge. We see the blind see and the lame walk. We see legs grow. We see demons flee. Are you with me? You can put your hands up if you're with me in this. 
We're full of the spirit. This is what we do as well as healing of minds and dealing with racism. And, and so we also bring healing to bodies. And I want to ask, Lord, tonight, any of you online, if you have um, a sore part that you can put your hands on or whatever, or you know of a family member, somebody comes to mind, just say their name. And we just say, and, and you know, this isn't about me. I work as a team. We're the church. I need all of you. I've got a bit of gifting. And we put all our bits of gifting together. And, oh, my word, are we powerful. I keep on saying we're the church because that's it. And to have so many people online, the power that is available. And it's not about Zoom and we're not in the room together. He's everywhere. He, we used to sing a song at Stonely, say the word and we will be healed. Do you remember those of you who remember that? Say the word. And so, Lord, we say the word and we ask for bodies to be healed tonight, Lord. We ask for bodies. While we are talking about racism, will you heal bodies, Lord? Will you heal? Um, let me see the words I've got here. Thyroid problems. There's somebody, people here with thyroid problems. Lord Jesus, will you come and heal thyroid problems tonight? We ask in your name. We're asking for the package deal here, Lord. Heal our racism but heal our bodies, heal thyroids. And there's people suffering from brain fog. You know, these things pop into one's mind, and so I just say it, brain fog. Uh, and I want to ask for healing from brain fog. It could be from, from ME or whatever. Do something. And, Lord, it says with COVID it can lead to ME. No, Lord, we do not want a church that has been made uh, helpless with ME. So we ask, Lord, you break ME over us and this region, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And then uh, uh, Graham Webb had psoriasis. Anybody with psoriasis? Um, one can hardly say it, never mind spell it. If you saw how I spelt it here, you'd laugh. Um, but, you know, it's not a, it's not a laughing uh, matter because psoriasis is a terrible thing that happens. And we ask for healing of all skin diseases, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We ask, Lord, for healing from everything that would come to harm people and that psoriasis will be broken in the name of Jesus. And the funny thing that came to mind as I was praying was a spirit of lethargy. It's like, oh, it's all too much. This is all too much. We just can't really go on. Father God, a break lethargy over us. We're the church. We are not those who deal with lethargy. We are those who are on the front foot bringing hope and help wherever we go. That's who we are, Lord, in Jesus' name. I want to ask, Lord, if there's anybody on screen here who's not baptized with the Holy Spirit and power, will you do it right there where they sit in Jesus' name? Full baptism of fire. We need the fire of God. Oh, wow. I'm longing for the fire of God. Oh, wow. And then, Lord, will you give us a breakthrough in evangelism, a breakthrough let us be able to see people get saved. Let us be able to go as teams of, of black and white and go and bring healing in, in wherever healing is needed. Lord, let us be able to go to homes now that we can go in small groups into home. Lord, let us go and knock on doors and say, we're the church. We've come to see, is there anybody sick in your home? We can social distance stand away from the door, we have power to speak in. And so um, if you get anything from tonight, we're the church. We bring healing. We bring hope. We break racism. We work hard towards renewing our minds so that we spot racism in ourselves and, uh, and we educate ourselves. And we, Lord Jesus, we just love you. We love you. We thank you for dying for us. 
thank you. Thank you so much that we are on level ground with you in Jesus' name. So, Graham, I'm going to la- hand over to you. Oh, Owen, have you got something to add to? Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I think the thing I, I just felt was, um, as you were, particularly as you were just coming to, I felt there was something about the just the openness of the north, the openness of of the north to this. Um, not necessarily where you'd historically think that, that would be the first place that would go. Look, we're open. We we want to know, um, but but you have. And I think that God is going to open a door that's going to surprise you uh, in terms of. Um, almost this, this holistic thing of the church coming uh, and in the noise churches have been small and it's been a battle and it's been a struggle uh, but but God's going to break open some new places for you in this area and I think if you embrace as you embrace the reconciled church it will open other doors that you never quite thought about that you never considered uh, there's a passage in Acts Acts 6 where they have that that racial disunity because one group of windows were being looked after in a way in a way that the others weren't. And the apostles deal with the problem. And it says at the end of that particular story, a large number of priests were added to the faith. And what it's really saying is when the establishment saw what the church was able to do in terms of bringing reconciliation between people and unity, they were like, oh, God must be in that. God must be in that. And and my prayer is that for the North, there is a blessing that is coming. Um, and there is, there is power that is coming. And where you have struggled, you won't struggle a freedom and an ease in what you're doing. Um, yeah, so that, that's just what I felt. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Graham? Yeah, we received that uh, for the whole north. Uh, I realise it's a long way from London uh, and Cambridge, uh, but uh, this started out as a northwest Christ Central Churches uh, together meeting and uh, it got hijacked, which I'm really glad about. Uh, but I believe God is doing something. And I think it is for us to move in a way we've not moved before, uh, to build on the restoration of the church and and really become uh, amazing in in, in the way we can reach all kinds of communities. So I thought it was brilliant, both uh, you, Angela, and Owen. You've served us amazingly, amazingly. Uh, I'd love it if anyone uh, has, has... felt God touch them right now. If you put it on the chat or uh, wave, it would be great to hear a testimony or two right now because God is moving. This is God's event tonight. Actually, it's quite hard to look through all the pages to see if anyone's waving. So uh, I guess you will have to put it on the chat. It is wonderful. So many of you have joined us tonight. Uh, We're so thankful. So what we'd love to do uh, to finish the evening is just sing the UK blessing. Uh, We'll zoom on to YouTube. Thanks to Dave. If you want the recording of this, uh, we'll uh, have details and Dave Krushek will be able to send it out to you. Uh, We would love uh, just to see God breaking in across all the churches. The church isn't closed. That's why I like the UK blessing. Uh, The churches are 
united on the UK blessing. I like that too. So, Angela, could you pray for us and then we'll sing together uh, the UK blessing? You'll have to unmute again. Thanks. Actually, Graham, I'd love Owen to pray for us. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I was just thinking exactly the same. Go for it, Owen. Uh, Father, we are we're, we're grateful. We're grateful that even um, with all the issues around technology, that we can gather together as your people, and that we can be envisioned and encouraged. Um, and Lord, I, my prayer is that you will put into the hearts of people who have listened today a seed. A prayer for a seed that that falls on good soil in the heart. So God, I pray for a seed that bears much fruit. I pray that in years to come, people will speak of the church reconciled. And when they talk about it, others will go, oh, what was it like before that? Lord, I pray that you will do something really significant. Lord, I pray that you'll do something significant in hearts. Lord, I don't just pray, I know you are doing something significant in hearts on this call today. And we pray it bears much fruit for the churches that are represented here, for the north, for, for New Frontiers, the north, Lord God, which is often maybe felt like it's out on a limb, it's there on its own. Lord, I pray that you will bring such breakthrough to this community of churches, that you will do something quite magnificent, truly amazing among them. Lord God, I, I pray for that. Lord, I pray for every person who has had their mind renewed today and their hearts healed today. Uh, Lord, I pray blessing upon them blessing upon their families even as we sing this song oh god lord that you would bring blessing generation upon generation to families in the north people who sacrificed life and left maybe the south to go north god bless them i pray in jesus name amen